Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We have resolved our technical difficulties. It would be great if you would all move forward because this is a big room yes. and it's hard for us to see with the lights in our eyes. So, so please move forward. So don't. <laughs> please, pretty please. <laughs> Uh, we would like you to move forward so the, the hall feels a little less cavernous up here. Thank you. Yes, you get two stars. Okay, first we'll lead with um, some announcements and then I'll let Veronique um, uh, introduce the uh, speaker. So, um, First of all, the uh, presentation of the geology, seismology, and tectonophysics joint early career award. Um, uh, uh, and uh, let's see, that's not where I wanted to start, sorry. Uh, first of all, the 2019 John Moore early career award citation. Uh, Raphael Grandin is a bright young scientist who studied a variety of geophysical problems related to seismology, rifting, and magmatic processes and earthquake source models. He uses space geodesy data, in particular GNSS and INSAR. He developed original and novel methods and obtained outstanding results, in particular in interpreting INSAR observations. So uh, the John Moore Early Career Award goes to um, Raphael Grandin. So it's a big room. <laughs> so thank you uh, very much. I'm very honored to be uh, elected for this award. And uh, so I would like to thank the Geodesy Committee for selecting uh, so my, uh, my name. And so I would like also to thank uh, uh, Gilles Pelzer and uh, Marie-Pierre Noin for nominating me and for all those who wrote the support letters. Uh, so I'm very thankful. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, uh, Jean-Bernard de Chabalier and uh, Anne Soquet, who are the, the persons who helped me to make my first steps into INSAR when I was doing my PhD, and I think they, are, they should be acknowledged too. And also Jeff King, my former PhD uh, supervisor, who really uh, made me uh, enjoy for the first time the freedom of uh, doing scientific research, and that's really uh, something that's inspiring for the, for the young scientists to show this freedom. And so thank you to everybody. Enjoy the, the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a second award um, to Frank Michael Fletchner of the German Research Center for Geosciences. That's the uh, 2019 Ivan Mueller Award, which is uh, awarded for distinguished service and leadership to geodesy. Frank is one of the, uh, the world, a few world experts of both Earth gravity field uh, of the Earth gravity field using space geodetic techniques. His nominator noted his contributions to the prayer satellite tracking system for precise orbitography and the development of the European models for the Earth gravity field. Frank contributed in the early 2000s to the German CHAMP mission dedicated to measure the magnetic and gravity fields of the Earth. And then he became project manager and events, eventually principal investigator for the GRACE mission for the German side. He regularly improved and updated the European GRACE solutions used by num numerous scientists worldwide for a broad range of applications from hydrogeodesy, cryosphere studies, oceanography, to climate research. Join me in congratulating Frank. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Megan, for choosing me for this. Uh, prestigious award. I'm very honored and proud to get this award. I also want to thank you my uh, nominators, uh, Srinivas uh, Betapur from CSR in Austin uh, for his very nice citation. Also to jo uh, Mike Watkins and especially to Byron Tapley and the initial co-PI of the GRACE mission, Chris Reichbar. Uh, who will always be an inspiration for me. 
Um, I'm grateful that I could help to develop and to uh, operate and to analyze the GRACE and now GRACE for Lawn satellite missions. And uh, these were really inspiring uh, projects uh, within my career. And I got uh, really a lot of inspiration, new friends, and I'm proud to be a part of the GRACE family and uh, thanks once again for this award. You're welcome and congratulations. And then lastly, we'd just like to announce that we have three new um, Geodesy affiliated AGU fellows. Zuhair Altamini, who is here, I believe. Uh, Kos Kosuki Heki from Hokkaido University. and Ben Chow from the Institute of Earth Sciences at Academia Sinica. Okay, and now I think I turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, it is my uh, great, our great pleasure to welcome Véronique Dohan uh, today as uh, the 2019 uh, William Bowie Lecture. Uh, just to remind you, the William Bowie Lecture recognizes a significant contribution uh, to fundamental geophysics as well as uh, unselfish cooperation uh, in research. So the William Bowie Lecture uh, was named in, uh, to honor the life of, uh, and work of uh, William Bowie, a geodetic engineer who also served as the uh, EGU first president. So, Véronique is a scientist at the Royal Observatory of Belgium. Her main research field is the rotation of the Earth and planets and their link with the internal structure of these bodies. She, she made groundbreaking contribution in this domain over the past uh, few decades, <laughs> not only a few years, and has gained exceptional uh, international recognition for her research. In the first half of her career, uh, Veronique research was centered on the rotation of the Earth uh, in space, that is precession and mutation, and uh, its strong link with internal structure of the Earth. Using observational constraints from long accurate uh, records from BLBI, uh, she, she was able to greatly improve on the, our understanding of coping mechanism, mechanism at work inside the Earth, in particular between the, the Earth's liquid core and, and the mantle. Uh, Véronique Dohan and uh, her team uh, further extended this kind of research to solid planets of the inner solar system, that is Mars, Venus, and Mercury, as well as to the icy satellites of the outer planet. And here also she made outstanding contribution. Uh, she, she, she proposed, uh, recently, she proposed a radio science instrument uh, on the ExoMars space mission uh, developed by the European, European Space Agency uh, to be launched uh, next year. And she was selected as principal investigator. Uh, earlier, she was selected as co-investigator of, of uh, several missions on Mars and Venus, uh, also developed by the European Space Agency, that is Ma Mars Express and Venus Express, and uh, as, well as, to, as well as to Mercury, uh, the BP Colombo mission, not yet launched. And uh, right now, she's involved uh, in the radio science experiment on board the, the NASA InSight uh, mission to Mars, and uh, she, I think she will talk about uh, results, recent results uh, on this program. She received several prestigious prizes, among them the Descartes Prize of the European Union, the Bomford Prize of the International Association of Geodesy, the Winning Minus Medal of the European Geoscience Union, uh, and the Charles Witten Medal of the AGU. She is fellow of the AGU and member of the Royal Ac Academy of uh, Science of, uh, in Belgium. So, uh, Veronique, the floor is now for you. Uh, we are very impatient to hear your lecture on Earth orientation and core flow and application to Mars. But before that, I have uh, the pleasure to give you this uh, diploma. And uh, we congratulate you for, 
for being uh, elected or selected for the Bow elections this year. So it's impressive. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Annie and Megan. Uh, it's a great honor to be here and to speak about my research. Um, I've, I have been working on the Earth's rotation, Earth's precession and mutation, and as well I've been working on Mars. Um, so my talk will be about two-thirds about the Earth and one-third about uh, the planet Mars. Uh, this Bowie lecture is dedicated to John War. Uh, with whom I had a chance to, to work. Um, I would like to thank uh, all my team. Uh, first of all, the team of uh, Rotanut. You will see in the, in the, in the slides that um, a lot of things have been discovered uh, thanks to them. Uh, Santiago Andres Triana, Jeremy Reque, and others. Also the Lara team, so the Mars team. <laughs> I would say Sébastien Lemestre, Marie Zobot, and the others, as well as the RISE team from the InSight uh, mission, Bill Faulkner, and, and others. <coughs> so it's working. <laughs> so um, the Earth uh, is not rotating uniformly. It has uh, changes in the rotation speed uh, called the length of day variations. It also changes its orientation in space the so-called precession and mutation, which I will define later. Uh, so these are changes in the uh, Earth's orientation in space, and as well you have changes of the uh, position of the rotation axis with respect to the planet itself, the so-called polar motion. Altogether, this is uh, very complex because you have uh, length of day variations, precession, mutation, polar motion, and you have to uh, determine all this by using um, a terrestrial frame and celestial frame because this is the link between both. Um, I'm going to mostly uh, discuss the, the problem of precession and mutation concerning the Earth and then concerning Mars. So <clears throat> precession and mutations, uh, I have to define them. Uh, it's related to the gravitational attraction of uh, the sun and the moon, mainly the other planets in a minor extent. You have a gravitational forces, uh, force, and uh, because the Earth is flattened, it's rotating, it's flattened, um, the uh, green arrows, they, are not, uh, they have not the same direction and the same amplitudes. Of course, the, the Earth is not falling on the sun, and you have uh, an inertial uh, force which um, counteract the gravitational forcing and uh, provide the revolution of the Earth uh, around the Sun. So, so that uh, the, uh, the resulting force is the yellow one, zero at the center. You have on the left um, a tower, uh, the north, and on, on the south tower, uh, and on the right tower, the south. So this, this is kind of... Um, um, yeah, a torque which tends to rock the equator uh, toward uh, the uh, ecliptic, so the, the, the orbital plan of the Earth with respect to the Sun. So because the Earth is uh, rotating, uh, it reacts as a top, and you have a long-term precession in space. This long-term precession so is uh, related to the fact that you have uh, an inclination of the Earth in space, a certain obliquity. Of course, this torque is not constant, and uh, it is changing with time. And you have, additionally to the precession, you have periodic changes called mutations. Uh, these mutations are in longitude and in obliquity, so along the precession and perpendicular uh, to the precession. And um, it's something like that. It's quite important because it's um, this... Um, uh, this motion, it's like if you look at the Earth uh, from space, if you look at the Earth, uh, this motion will, will be within a square of uh, 600 meters. So it's quite important. So we have to correct that if we want to do positioning on Earth. How are they uh, observed? 
They are observed by using very long baseline interferometry. These are big antennas on the Earth, and these big antennas, they are measuring, they are observing quasars. Quasars are objects which are far away from the Earth, uh, so far that um, they are the, the, rad the radiation coming from them are coming like plane waves. And they don't move almost, they don't, they don't move in space, so they are like spot um, in the sky. So the, the, they are emitting in all the frequency band, including X band uh, or S band, and uh, these are, these, uh, noise, this noise is arriving uh, at the Earth, and what we can do is to compare the arrival time at a different station. And uh, this uh, delay between the two stations uh, will be used to determine uh, the rotation of the Earth and the variation of the orientation of the Earth. So, of course, there is not only one quasar. There are several of them and several stations on the surface of the Earth. So, um, we can use these observations of uh, precession and uh, nutation using very long baseline interferometry. Uh, these observations, again, if you look at a square um, perpendicular to, to the surface of the Earth, but from space, this is what you will see. You see the rotation axis moving and doing these cycloid uh, wiggles that I have shown before. So this square is like a 600 meter um, um, uh, square. And you have motion like that. This is observation. Uh, well, simulating observations. Of course, you can compute uh, these uh, precession and mutation, these mutations, you can compute them, and I will show how we can do that. And you can compare the, the models with respect to the observation. Um, we are aiming at uh, uh, computing, modeling the response of the Earth to the gravitational forcing uh, so that the model really fits the observation. This is what we get in terms of residuals with respect to a model. Of course, at the beginning of uh, VLBI, it was very noisy. So we, if we, we look at uh, um, the latest uh, part, we have uh, residuals like that. This is like uh, about 10 centimeters. And what you see here, it's uh, the, these wiggles that you see uh, there, uh, these are, these are what we call a free core mutation. This is a normal mode of the Earth, which is excited and uh, that we cannot predict. We can uh, follow it, but we cannot predict. It's like the channel wobble for polar motion. It, this is for mutation and it's called a free core mutation. Um, of course, what you can do when you have such observations, when you have models, well, you can try to uh, determine properties of the deep interior, exactly as um, when, you, when you have a, a cooked egg and a rotating egg, and you make them rotating, they are rotating differently. With a little bit of habit, you can tell this one is cooked, this one is not. So by looking at the rotation and the Earth's orientation in space, you can uh, determine uh, very deep properties of the Earth. And this is what uh, we're going to do for the Earth and for the planet Mars. But let us come back to the Earth. So the force mutations can be computed by using an internal model for the Earth, first of all. So you need, uh, the, the, you need to know what is the composition, what is the structure of the Earth. This is given by the seismologist. <coughs> And then you can compute the Earth's response to a gr unit gravitational uh, potential and then combine with the amplitude of the uh, rigid Earth mutation in order to get the non-rigid Earth uh, model. And with a small corrections related to oceanic or uh, atmospheric uh, um, effects, then uh, you can compare with the observations. And this is what uh, we, we do. We compare observation and theory, and we try to refine uh, the, the, the interior of the Earth. We try to refine the models uh, that, are, um, that are not explained, that is not explained by the observation. 
So what is the existing model? The existing model of the Earth consider an inner core, an ellipsoidal Earth, with a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, um, an inelastic mantle, and uh, um, it has as well normal modes. I already mentioned uh, one of them, the free core nutation. These modes uh, exist uh, when you excite an angle between the rotation axis of the mantle and the rotation axis of the core. And so you, if you excite that, uh, uh, that angle, if when the core is flattened, uh, you have pressure effect on the, uh, on the boundary. And this is a normal mode of the Earth, and it's related to the flattening of the Earth. We have similar one, a similar one at the inner core boundary. It is called the free inner core uh, nutation. And uh, we, we have to consider um, electromagnetic coupling as well there and other mechanisms. So uh, the only way then uh, to, to, to reach uh, this kind of uh, uh, the parameters inside uh, the Earth is uh, to correct for uh, the free modes because we, wanna, we want to see the force mutation and the uh, resonance related to the force mutation. And this free mode cannot be predicted, but it can be estimated uh, like it is done here as a function of time. You have um, the amplitude, so one millisecond is one milli arc second is like three centimeters at the surface. And this is the contribution of the normal modes. If you take that out, you have residuals. And the residuals <coughs> are here um, in, in black and red. In black is the uh, IRS uh, residuals, uh, International Earth Rotation Service, um, with respect to the adopted model. And um, the red one is the one we determined by a fitting uh, um, mutation uh, on the data. When you have mutation observation, you can determine the, what we call the basic Earth parameters. These are parameters of the deep interior. They are listed uh, on, on the left here, and uh, the columns, the other columns, they are estimation of these basic Earth parameters uh, done by different authors, and the last one is being uh, our, our own estimation. And uh, one of them is, for instance, the uh, flattening of the core and uh, a real and imaginary part of the coupling constant at the core mental boundary or at the inner core boundary. And we will focus on these. Um, so the coupling constant at the core mental boundary. So these are the range. We, we can estimate the ranges uh, for, these, uh, for this constant. Uh, not, not a problem at all uh, to estimate the range and to have values. The problem is to interpret uh, these uh, parameters, like the coupling constant at the CMB. Uh, and this is what we, we will do now. And we, we, we leave um, uh, the uh, inner core boundary for uh, questions or uh, discussion with me later on. So what we have at the core, uh, when we try to interpret the core mental boundary uh, coupling constants, um, we try to interpret using um, um, magnetic fields and uh, the, the magnetic field line due to the rotation are stretched. And this induces a coupling between the core and the mantle. This, uh, and it induces forces, Lorentz force, at the core mental boundary. And um, from the coupling constant, you can estimate uh, the, the magnetic field you will need to explain the observation. And what you see is that what you need is at the level of 0 0.6 millitesla, while the observations are more at the level of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, millitesla. So there is a problem. So uh, we cannot only explain the coupling constants at the core mental boundary by uh, only using electromagnetic torque. We need to uh, consider other mechanisms. And the other mechanism of the coupling between the core and the mantle, this is the topographic torque and the viscous torque. So normally, gravitational effects and electromagnetic torque are considered classically, but we need to consider further viscous and topographic torque. And as well, I think we need to consider that there are flow within the core and that the flow in the core um, can really matter uh, in terms of uh, the free core nutation. You can look at this experiment. This was done by 
uh, Andres uh, Santiago, uh, Andres Triana, oh, it doesn't work, well, um, this experiment is a rotating uh, sphere, and this sphere, when you make it rotating, you can really see, uh, it's not a secret, you can do that with, uh, with, with water and uh, shaving cream, and you put that in a sphere, you make it rotating, and you will really see some resonance effect, Rossby waves appearing in, the, in this. So the flow within the core is important, and the resonance effects are important too. Something very interesting, this is a toy model. This is, um, when you put a, when you change the velocity, when you have a velocity perturbation near a boundary, and if the, if the core would not be rotating, then the, in the non-rotating case, the velocity perturbation stay localized. This is what you have on your left. But when the fluid is rotating, um, the, the velocity field perturbation is propagating in, uh, propagated uh, into the fluid and inertial waves are excited. And you have, uh, when you see here, uh, you have kind of shear waves, so velocity is going in one direction and the other direction. This is better seen here, which is not from, from our group, uh, it's from uh, Yu Feng Lin. Uh, you see shear waves for different viscosities. And so the, this exists within uh, the core. So we think that the effect from the core flow itself is important to model, uh, to model the mutations. Uh, inertial waves in the core have to be considered together with the rotational modes. And dissipation mechanism inside the core as well as at the boundary have to be considered in addition to the electromagnetic field. And this is where uh, the group uh, uh, in Brussels uh, came into the game. This is the Rotanut uh, ERC um, on uh, rotation and mutation of a wobbly earth. And uh, that was the idea that has been developed. Uh, this is the concept. We wanted to have a fully coupled, self-consistent core mantle model. Uh, the, this, this explains the concept. In fact, when you have uh, people from Geodynamo, they consider um, the core and they consider what is going on inside the core and they don't care about what is going in the mantle. And people like me doing mutation, uh, previously we were, we, we were uh, looking at what is going on at the surface of the earth and in the mantle and we were prescribing what should be in the core, like a Poincaré fluid in the core. So here we wanted to have a, a system which is uh, fully coupled the core and the mantle. So that's the model. We have a, a mantle, which is flattened, of course, and, uh, and rotating and the core. And inside the core, you have Navier-Stokes equations. Um, this, uh, this slide uh, seems to be rather complicated, but it's just, um, in fact, the kinetic energy of the mantle uh, with respect to the core. So if the whole energy is in the mantle, this is in a logarithmic scale, you have a dot which will be very high in, in, the, in, in the sketch there, uh, in, in the graphic there, uh, like the Chandler wobble and like the free core mutation which you have. Um, the color points there, they are inertial waves. So they are small, well the energy uh, in the mantle is uh, compared to the, in the core compared to the energy in the mantle is large. So uh, they appear like lower with respect to the free core mutation. Uh, the amplitudes there, uh, the, the, the colors are uh, related to um, the damping. The darker they are, the darker they are, the, damp, uh, the more damp they are. So the, this is computed for uh, 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 core uh, with several parameters. You can play with the parameters, try to understand what is going on. And um, this is for a certain flattening, a uh, certain moment of inertia for, for the, the mantle, and a certain viscosity, which is represented by the so-called Ekman number. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna focus on the mutation, so in the frame related to the Earth's diurnal uh, time frame. And um, what we have, uh, uh, this is the work mainly of uh, uh, Santiago Andres Triana, uh, we see that um, um, if we focus on the frequencies, 
uh, within uh, the, the frequency band of the mutation, you can see as a function of uh, changes in the moment of inertia of the mantle that the frequencies are changing. And uh, you see the free core mutation and you see different uh, almost horizontal lines. Uh, they are the inertial waves. And there are even um, uh, some parameters where the free core mutation exchange uh, his, its uh, personality uh, with the inertia waves. Um, uh, this this uh, parameter, moment of inertia of the core, called Q here, um, the for the Earth, it's, it's uh, uh, less than one. Um, but for, for instance, for Enceladus, you can have something like two. So uh, I invite you to see the poster of uh, Jeremy Riquet uh, on that. And uh, concerning the Earth, we are in the, in, in the range, so lower than one, but this was done without a magnetic field. And so adding magnetic field uh, can even change that more. So, and yes, the talk of uh, Andres uh, uh, will, will, on Thursday uh, will uh, describe all that. Something interesting is uh, related to the inertia waves is again we are here in the frequency band uh, related to uh, the mutations. Uh, here it's the uh, free inner core mutation. The other one would be much more in, in, on, on the right. And what is uh, shown in these two graphs uh, are the ohmic dissipation and the viscous dissipation. What is usually believed is that the ohmic dissipation increases when uh, you increase the viscosity. And so the viscosity, uh, the viscous dissipation decrease. But um, when you see this graphic, uh, you, this graphic, the different colors, they are for different magnetic fields. So you change the magnetic field and you see that it's really not smooth at all and uh, that there are some uh, wiggles at different frequencies. And these wiggles, so for the Earth, uh, we are um, between the green, light, uh, the green line and the purple one. And so you see that, um, in fact, um, the inertial modes uh, peak might persist and uh, that uh, total energy dissipation depends on how close you are with your, with your mode with respect to inertial waves. So really, this is important to have these inertial waves into the game. So the conclusion of this first part, and it's uh, only the two-third uh, of my talk, I still have one-third, one um, the conclusion is that uh, we have uh, enhanced numerical codes that, are, um, that have been developed within the Rotanut project. Uh, inertial waves and the global mutation uh, in the free core, they interact. The free core mutation can be influenced very much uh, associated with viscosity and electromagnetic fields. There are internal dissipations, so viscous and uh, ohmic dissipations the frequencies and damping of the inertial modes and the global rotation mode change in the core um, with core flattening, viscosity represented by the Ekman number, moment of inertia, as well as with uh, the magnetic field. And so stay tuned because we'll have more results uh, soon and uh, we will present these results uh, here at AGU. Okay, now we shift to another planet. There is one planet which is also rotating fast and so that is also flattened, and this is the planet Mars. And we have the, the chance that to have an inclination of the planet Mars at uh, the level of 25 degrees. So um, the planet Mars undergo precession and mutation, exactly as for the Earth. So you remember the eggs, right? So it's not working? Okay. So um, you remember the eggs. There is one which was cooked and the other one was not. And um, wrote, when they are rotating, uh, in fact, um, when they are rotating, uh, you can really discover whether the, the eggs are cooked or not. Similarly, for, for the planet Mars, um, you can observe mutations so uh, changes in the orientation of the planet Mars. And then if you observe that, uh, if the core is liquid, so if you have a raw egg, if the core is liquid, you will have amplification uh, of the mutations. These amplifications are related to the free core mutation. 
This question is whether the core is solid or liquid is very important because we don't know where we are in the evolution of Mars. We know that there was a, a magnetic field at the beginning um, of, the, of the life of Mars, um, but now it has disappeared. So what we can do to, to answer the question is to use radio science. So radio link between spacecraft and the Earth, uh, which we know precisely, almost precisely, in space, uh, and uh, direct link from the Earth to, to, to uh, the planet Mars. So this is the idea. We send, um, we send a signal from Earth, uh, and we have some, some transponder at the surface of Mars, like... Uh, like a, a, a coherent transponder, so that means that uh, you don't add any phase from the instrument, you send exactly like a mirror back to the signal back to Earth. And then you measure the Doppler shift on the radio signal. By measuring this Doppler shift, you have the relative uh, velocity of Mars with respect to the Earth. And so from that, you can determine uh, Mars rotation and Mars orientation in space. So um, there is one mission that has been sent uh, to Mars and uh, that is already uh, deposited at the surface since November 2018. This is the InSight mission. This uh, InSight means interior exploration using seismic investigation, geodesy, and heat transport. So um, geodesy is in. And uh, there are antennas, two antennas, uh, that are communicating with the Earth. So we can communicate with the Earth and we can do, uh, we can compute the Doppler, we can uh, observe the Doppler shift uh, of the signal and compute uh, the uh, planet uh, orientation and uh, length of day variations. So from that, we hope to determine uh, properties of the deep interior. So that's the, not the only mission that will um, allow us to determine uh, the precession and mutation. There is also the ExoMars 2020 mission uh, with the instrument LARA, which is a Belgian instrument. Um, this is a very cute uh, instrument. It's a little, uh, it's, it's even uh, smaller than a shoe, shoe box, and the antennas, they, they can be in the hands. So it's, it's really very cute. So uh, well, we hope it, it, will, it will work, of course. <laughs> uh, it will be sent to Mars in uh, July uh, 2020. So I said that uh, Mars is, uh, has an inclination of 20 degrees, it is flattened, so we have exactly the same as for the Earth. And then we have a torque which tends to rock the equator toward the ecliptic. And so therefore we have precession and mutation. And if the core is liquid, you have a, a resonance effect, which is due, uh, which is called the free core mutation resonance. And I was speaking about that for the Earth. Here, um, what we show is the, the periods and uh, the, um, the uh, resonance amplitude for different dimension of the core. You have the nominal core in green and a, core, a smaller core in blue and a larger core in, in red. The vertical lines, they indicate where we are observing. So you have the annual, semi-annual, terrannual, and uh, uh, one-fourth uh, of the year. So you have uh, several annotations and we will observe them. And of course, uh, observing the terrannual uh, will be very interesting because the terrannual mutation um, for a small core will have a very small uh, uh, resonance effect for a medium core, medium, and for a large core, a very large resonance. So really, with this observation, we'll be able to determine, first of all, to confirm that the core of Mars is liquid, and then uh, to, to determine the dimension of the core. So the dimension of the core will be mainly determined by uh, RISE, which is the uh, radio science experiment on InSight, and uh, mental rheology uh, and uh, yeah, properties of the mantle will be determined uh, from the seismometer. And there is a whole session, uh, so DI14A, uh, which is dedicated to seismology. And Bill Faulkner will speak in our session in G41A, uh, um, so on Thursday as well. Um, I present you here very uh, 
well, result that you have never seen because it will be presented in a poster soon. So this is the determination of precession um, that has been done using insight. So what you see here, uh, the different colors are determination of the precession using previous spacecraft. This is Viking, a Pathfinder, uh, and, and uh, uh, all, all the previous uh, lander. Uh, the Mer was, were Mer's, it's Mars exploration rovers. They were also used uh, because um, when they were stacked on the surface, uh, we could use them as a fixed point. And now we have insight, and you have insight there and uh, there will be a poster um, in, in, in the DI-51, so on Friday, presenting all this. So this is the determination of the precession. You see now the precision we can get using the RISE data from inside. So we have very precise values of the precession, which provide us with very precise value of the moment of inertia. MOI, MOI is moment of inertia of the mantle. So we can determine the moment of inertia of the whole planet um, uh, using a rise and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, the data that we have, one year data that we have, almost, a little bit less. And then um, what you have here, what the graphic represents, is the core, uh, the core radius, so it's the core dimension. And uh, the, the different colors indicates different um, models for the mantle, because we don't know the, the composition of the mantle. So you have different models, and the gray and vertical line, the gray line that you see there, this is the determination with the error bars of the moment of inertia. So what you see is it's very precise, so we can determine, we can already say that the core uh, would be uh, at this kind of dimension, so between uh, 1,650, and uh, uh, 1800s. So if you then uh, consider that you have some uncertainty uh, on, on, on the crustal thickness, which we don't know very precisely, you, you, you have this, oops, this kind of, uh, of ranges. So, and this is something uh, that uh, you have never seen neither. Uh, these are um, the mutations, uh, the residuals of the mutations. Um, so there is where we should see uh, the signature of the core. And so the, this, these are the black dots and the error bars. We are still working on the, these data. We are still calibrating them against troposphere effect and, and uh, yes, plasma effect. And um, the colors that you see there, these are what you would expect for uh, as residuals if you consider different free core mutation. So if you have a free core mutation, which would be very close to the terrannual, you will get this uh, uh, blue, light blue curve that you see. So if you are very near, so this would be a very large core. And what you already see in the data is that you can eliminate a very large core. So now if we, we want to summarize both precession and mutation, uh, we have some constraints on the core uh, dimension, uh, and this represents you the mutation amplitudes, uh, the terrannual mutation amplitude, and you see the resonance effect when the core is liquid. And if you consider the value of the precession that we have observed, this is limiting uh, the range of the core, and similarly with the, the mutations, but stay tuned because this is not the final uh, word. So stay tuned as well for the future missions, and uh, in particular for our, or, uh, our own instrument, LARA, that will be sent to Mars in uh, July 2020, hopefully. So I'd like to acknowledge, of course, all my team, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, AGU, Annie, and, and Megan for, for this honor. And of course, I would like to uh, thank the ERC uh, for what was possible concerning the Earth, and the uh, Prodex uh, and the uh, Federal Science Policy Office of Belgium, of Belgium um, for the part related to Mars, and thank you for your attention.
questions? Over here. What do you mean? You, you think for the earth, huh? Yeah, you have to consider what is going on inside the core and you have no way to go there. So indeed, at the inner core boundary, we have it can be, well, the uh, coupling constant between the core and the inner core can be determined using the free inner core mutation. It's another frequency. While for the core, the, the, the CMB, the core mantle boundary, you need to look at the frequency of the free core mutation. And that is, well, they are very, uh, very close together. Uh, but one is uh, a little bit uh, below one and the other one is a little bit after one. So, but indeed, uh, the, the, the presence of an inner core is important too because it, it, it will induce some uh, effect on the flow and, uh, and on the dissipation and on, on everything. Other questions? Yeah. Well, in, in so, so, so what? Uh, how is it compatible with the fact that uh, uh, Mars has no more magnetic field? Magnetic field. So, so the question is about the magnetic field of Mars and uh, uh, how it, how it is compatible to have a liquid core and uh, and no magnetic field. So um, first of all, the 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 state of the core is, has been already determined from the tidal effect, so the deformation of the planet that has, has induced an effect on the spacecraft orbiting the planet. So the time variation of the gravity field um, provides you with what is called the K2 log number. And this has been determined from spacecraft, but it's really at the limit of what we can do. Uh, but in any case, in, in, term, in terms of uh, thermal evolution of Mars, we believe that the core is liquid. Um, the core is liquid and uh, there is no magnetic field anymore. Well, to have a magnetic field, you need to have motion, an important motion, to produce the magnetic field. So, yes, you have two, two ways. Uh, you, have, um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can have a motion uh, induced by uh, heat, uh, and convection, thermal convection. And, but this you had at the very beginning of the solar system when you had a, a big, uh, a large gradient uh, of temperature. Then at that time, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it was convecting and you had a magnetic field. Um, but there is an, a second way to, to obtain a magnetic field and that is to form the inner core, which is believed uh, to be the reason why we have a magnetic field on Earth. So the, the precipitation of iron forming the inner core um, is, is, uh, is producing uh, the magnetic field that is observed on the Earth. So we don't observe magnetic field on Mars. Uh, we have observed uh, remanent magnetic field uh, from 4.6 uh, billion years to 4 billion years, and then the magnetic field disappeared. Um, and but that doesn't mean that the core is solid. It just means that there is no motion and maybe that the inner core is not yet forming. And we believe that the core is liquid and the inner core is not yet forming. But it still needs to be demonstrated. Good question. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, well, I encourage you to attend the Geodesy reception at 6.30 this evening at the uh, Marriott Marquis, Golden Gate B12, or B2. And thank you for joining us. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you.
and nominate people for geodesy section awards this year. 